All right, let's get started. Uh, uh, does anyone have any questions for me about the last time or any, any subject or any topic? All right, uh, so next, next Wednesday will be your first midterm exam. Dorothy will proctor the exam and won't be here for that. Uh, it'll be in this classroom. Uh, it will, uh, we're going to release all the slides from this today's lecture, tomorrow's lecture, online tomorrow. And these two lectures, the videos from these lectures will also be posted tomorrow. So if you need to review, want any of these materials to review. But it's going to be very similar to all the midterms that are posted in format, uh, posted on my website. It will be six questions, pick five. Uh, is straight out of the materials, the readings and the lectures. There's no nothing sneaky about it. And whenever I say something, this is a very important idea, I usually that's something you can tell the professor thinks is you know, an exam worthy when I say something like that. Um, any questions about that? Yes, merit, merit right? Merit. It's with a T, merit. Yes, yeah. yes. How long will we have to complete the exam? Uh, 75 minutes, like here. Okay, the duration of the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else? Okay, so uh, last time we talked about the social construction of illness and health, and we examined this idea primarily through the lens of female reproduction. Uh, and we saw how our ideas about what is and is not disease can inform our responses to it and what actions we take, and our further creation of knowledge and indeed our perception of the world. We also saw how a natural childbirth movement emerged in the 80s and 90s and how, while quite understandable, the situation is complicated in that the burden of mortality in natural circumstances can, in fact, be what most people would regard as unacceptably high. And today, we're going to be shifting gears and talking about the experience of death and dying, and it's going to be a rather more somber uh, session. Uh, but I, I think it's important because it's, it's become very fashionable to speak about vulnerable populations, hasn't it, in our society or with respect to health and health care. But it's difficult to imagine a more vulnerable population than those among us who are dying, right? The terminally ill don't get signs and march in the street and say, you know, we want better terminal care because they're dying. They're weak. They have other priorities than political change, right? So I think it's not a coincidence that our society tends to neglect the care of the dying. We do, as you will see today, and as you saw in the readings, a terrible job caring for dying people in our society. It's a travesty. It's immoral, as far as I'm concerned. And it's rectifiable. Part of the reason, I think, is, as I've just been suggesting, is that it is hard to get a political advocacy group, even though about 3 million Americans die uh, every year. So I, I thought we'd begin by sort of understanding the experience of death in the United States. The, the typical trajectory is that, first of all, death is a problem of the aged. 75% of deaths occur in people older than 65. So most people who die are older. Not everyone who dies is older. Um, and uh, they, there's some onset of illness. People get some disease. And usually that disease is chronic. 75% of deaths are after a chronic illness. Only 25%, the minority of deaths, are after an acute, sudden illness, like a stroke or a heart attack or an infection or something that fells you. Most diseases are diseases that people have for quite a while before they, uh, you know, start to succumb to their disease. Uh, and typically, they have many years of illness and um, treatment before they finally enter the terminal phase of their illness, which is what I used to take care of. I was a hospice doctor for many years and took care of people who were dying in the last year of their life. And this terminal phase typically lasts between 2 and 12 months. Uh, and usually that, there's a kind of a gradual decline during that terminal phase, although it depends on the diagnosis. Sometimes it sort of goes up and down. Sometimes it's just steadily down. Uh, there's, a, you know, kind of a variation pattern. But generally speaking, things are getting worse over the last year of life. Patients often, but not always, often have pain. And that's what we typically think about when we think about dying people, is that they're in pain. But I can tell you that there are many other symptoms that patients have near the end of life 
that often are much more bothersome to them even than pain, and often much more difficult to treat. One of the things about pain is that 96% of pain syndromes are so-called somatic pain. That's when the, the tissues of your body are injured, and the nerves detect that injury and tell your brain it hurts. And about 4% are so-called neuropathic pain. That's when the nerve itself is injured, and then your brain gets a message, pain, but it's a kind of a barren message. That's much harder to treat when the nerve itself is injured and when the tissue are injured and the nerve is detecting. The former somatic pain is really treatable with opioids, morphine-type drugs, fentanyl, and so on. Very powerful drugs, which I used a lot when I was a doctor to take care of patients. But really often patients have other symptoms which are much worse. For example, dyspnea or shortness of breath. Can you imagine being hungry for air all the time, feeling like you're drowning all the time? and harder to treat that symptom, or itch and itchiness. Some people have itchiness where they just rub their, bo their bodies raw from scratching, it's difficult to treat itchiness. Or even constipation, which you might laugh, but people get really distended near that and very uncomfortable. And something just like relieving their constipation can often make them feel like a new person. People have dyspnea about half the time near the end of life. Fatigue is another very common symptom, and depression which is often untreated, and there's no reason not to treat depression, often with very powerful drugs near the end of life. But I'm not worried. There's a lot of concern amongst patients themselves and about others that what if so-and-so becomes addicted? Well, they're dying. Actually, you're not really so concerned about addiction at that stage. So it kind of frees you up to use all kinds of wonderful drugs that you might avoid in someone who you might actually be quite concerned about addiction. And the last week of life, this typically involves a kind of shutting down when you enter the really the final phase. Often um, people get very disconnected. They are in go, engaged in a process of letting go. Right? They've, they've let go of their hopes to live a long time. They've, they've let go of their bodies. Right? They, 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 they kind of let go of the expectation that their bodies will function. They have to let go of their loved ones, which is often the last thing. Some of you may have had parents or siblings who died, and you know what I'm talking about. The last thing they let go of is their loved ones, and then they let go of their life at the end. Okay? If they have the opportunity. Sometimes there's a sudden change for the worst. And, and about half the time, people lapse into a coma. A coma is when you're alive, but you can't respond to external stimuli. Um, and that can last about... 48 hours or so, or certainly less than a week, typically. And then there's a cessation of bodily function. Patient's heart stops, their breathing stops, and they die. And I've been in the room with hundreds of people at the moment that have held their hands. I've seen it. I can tell you it's, uh, it's very mysterious uh, being with people when they die. And it's not a very common experience in our society. Now, the emotional phases that people go through were classically described by a very famous book. It's becoming a pop culture thing. You know, the Kubler-Ross phases of, you know, response to, to death, which are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Right? I don't know if you've heard of these things before. The idea that, first of all, the sick person denies that they're angry, uh, that denies that they're terminally ill, then they get angry that they're terminally ill, then they sort of bargain with God, uh, then they get depressed, and then the last stage is acceptance. And these are not always sequential. I mean, this is the classic description by Google Ross. They're not always sequential, and they're not always seen. But it's still, these are still phenomena that one witnesses uh, in dying people. And there's hope in all the phases of life. And when I was a young doctor in training, uh, I learned something that then I used to tr train other doctors, which is I was taught when talking to a terminally ill patient, to sit down, of course, at the patient's bedside, eye to eye. Well, why do we sit down? Partly the power, but that's not the main reason. What, what, what do you signal when you sit down? Closeness. Sincerity. What? Seriousness. Seriousness. You signal that you're not in a hurry. All of you have been to doctors. The doctor comes whisking in, right, standing up. How is it doing? Thing? Oh, yeah, bye. See, they're, they're in a hurry to get out of your presence. But dying people really don't want you to brush out. Right? No patients want you to brush out. So you sit down, and you signal your availability to the patient. And one of the questions that I would often ask is, tell me a little bit about your hopes and dreams. 
And my students would always say, well, Nicholas, you know, how can you, how can you ask a terminally ill patient about their hopes and dreams? And my answer would be, what makes you think a terminally ill patient doesn't have hopes and dreams? They're human, like the rest of us. And you treat them as human beings, right? And often they have all kinds of hopes and dreams, like, I, I hope my wife does okay after I die. I, I would love to be reconciled with my son. I'm really worried that I'm going to be in pain. Doc, do you think there's an afterlife? You know, I mean, there are lots of questions that the dying have, lots of hopes and aspirations they have. And you can talk to them about it. They're not stupid just because they're dying. And the concerns of the dying are many. They, one of them is that the world goes on, right? They're thinking, oh my God, I'm dying, but all these other people around here, they're, after I'm gone, they're just going to go about their business. It's very poignant, actually. It's very hard for me as a doctor even to cope with that sensibility. They're worried about their families. They're afraid of the beyond or of nothingness. They have feelings of solitude and loneliness about 20% of the time. Sometimes they have feelings of disembodiment or disconnection from their bodies. Many dying people I've spoken to will say, well, you know, my body is dying. They kind of look at it as if it's like some object apart from themselves. Or they're angry at their bodies, and who wouldn't be? Look at this body becoming decrepit, you know? Or the inexorability of their disease. You know, it's like beating your head against a wall, fighting against an enemy that will not yield. Or, most importantly, a search for meaning. You guys don't think so much about meaning, at least not explicitly. You're engaged in a lot of meaning-making activities like any human being. But as you get older and close to death, First of all, you get older in general, but especially you have said, you have a lot of questions about the meaning of life and the meaning of your own life. These are all very standard things that a good doctor will engage their terminally ill patients in talking about. But alas, as we shall see, people have bad deaths in our society despite being in medical care and despite the fact that everything I've just told you is available in textbooks. This is nothing super secret I've just told you. It's just that doctors tend not to take account of this information. So let's see if we can get a visual picture of what a dying person looks like, something that in modern life is usually far removed from most people's experience. This is a woman a few years before she died, very healthy, appearing, everything is fine. And here she is after the onset of her illness, but still more than a year before her death. And an illness, as you can see, is very aging. Maybe some of your grandparents are, have had such an experience, and you've seen it, how it ages the person, and it's exhausting. And here she is much closer to death. And I'm showing you these pictures to try to give you a feel for what the experience of death in our midst might be like. And it's hard sometimes for students who are by and large young and healthy to get a feeling for the experience of dying. But the dying often have a very different perspective. I was once caring for a very wise terminally ill patient um, who had when I was a young doctor in training, who had tremendous equanimity about her death, fearless, like a, like, a, like a samurai warrior, fearless in the face of death. And I asked her about this. I said, I don't understand. I said, I, I can't understand how you are this way. And she said to me, she said, you can't understand because you are young and healthy, but a dying patient needs to die like a sleepy person needs to sleep. It was the closest she could come to giving me an analogy. You know, like that feeling you have when you're completely exhausted. You don't even want to take off your clothes. You just want to go in your room and go to bed. Like, it's that kind of feeling she was trying to tell me. She was exhausted from her illness. She was ready for death. It wasn't so much that she wanted to die, but she was ready for it. This is Frank. He's dying of lung cancer at his home in rural Pennsylvania. This is within a day of his death. Any doctor like me could see that. He's very emaciated. He's sort of unconscious or semi-conscious. And he's shown here with his son, his son's wife, and his grandson. And what I want you to focus on is not so much the physical appearance of Frank, which is typical, in case you didn't know it, uh, of people who are dying of a solid tumor, like colon or lung or brain or something like that. Rather, I want you to focus on the way Frank is embedded in his family, even while dying, and on the emotions of the people of the, of, the, of the faces of the people in his family. And people manage this well. Families and patients can manage this well if there is symptom control and good professional help and support. 
and getting a feel for what a good death is and how often it is achieved in our society and what, what might be done to facilitate this outcome is the focus for today. Now, death is primarily a problem of the aged, as I told you, though not exclusively. So 75% are older than 65, 10% here. In your age group, it's very rare that people die. They do, but, but it's rare. And these data are old, but the story is still the same. As a country, these are now quite old, actually, about 20 years old. These are Medicare expenditures. These are money spent on people older than 65. Everyone older than 65 is covered with Medicare in our society, almost everyone. And so this is a very good indicator of what happens to the elderly who are dying. We spent about $24,000 in the last year of life and about 9,000 the prior year and 7,000 the year before that. So spending unsurprisingly really goes up as we get closer to death. And expenditures in the last year of life declined substantially with age at death. Why is that? The older and older you are, the less it costs when you die. Why might that be? I forgot your name. Hey. More sudden. <clears throat> Could be more sudden. That's good. Could be more sudden. What else? Yeah. What's your name again? Sana. Sana. Is it because people become like less resistant? Like old people yes. Yeah, so as you get older, the patients themselves might want less and less. I'm 90 years old. Let me go, doc. <coughs> or the doctors are less, you know, like a 25 year old brought into your emergency room when I was a young doctor. Maybe one day I'll tell you some stories. We would uh, spit blood to save this person's life. We would try so hard. 90, 80, 90, not the same. Actually, there's a debate about this, whether that's true, right or not. It's an old topic. Um, but, the, but the expenditures did not vary by race or gender in, in multivariate models. There's not so much variation like this. And Americans clearly spend enough money so that they are entitled to have terrific terminal care and a good death. In fact, about 25% of all healthcare spending by Medicare and in general is spent on the last year of life. So the great bulk of our money is, spent, unsurprisingly, spent near the end of life. And what do Americans want for this money? Well, one survey of seriously ill patients from your readings found numerous attributes of a good death. But today I'm going to focus on how we are doing in meeting five key attributes about which there's generally unanimous opinion. People generally want to be free from pain, not burden their family, have a doctor who listens, and die at home, and know what to expect. That is, they want some prognostic information. And I also will note that having family present is endorsed by 81% of people. So most people, 81% of Americans, feel like having family present when you die is really important to a good death. But during the COVID-19 pandemic, as you may remember, hundreds of thousands of Americans died alone. Actually, met very few of these criteria. Our rich nation, which should have been prepared, but for our government and our inability to work together, failed in coping with the onslaught of the scenes in the pandemic. Now, some classic data about the dying experience in the United States comes from a famous study called the Support Study, the study to understand prognoses and preferences for outcomes and risks of treatments. It's now 20 years old, but it's still quite illustrative. This was a very large cohort study with an embedded randomized controlled trial that tried to make things better. And the patients in the support study were representative of a large fraction of deaths in the United States. The, the nine conditions, so they were, I don't know, 9,000 patients with nine life-threatening conditions. These were acute respiratory failure, severe congestive heart failure, non-traumatic coma, severe liver cirrhosis, severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, metastatic lung cancer, metastatic colon cancer, multiple organ system failure with sepsis, and multiple organ system failure with malignancy. Those are all nine bad things, okay? Those are bad, serious illness constellations in the end of life. And they enrolled these patients from uh, 1989 to 1994 at five hospitals in different states. They spent over $30 million on this study, trying to say, okay, what's the predicament of the dying, people dying of serious illness in our hospitals, where we have doctors and money and equipment and nurses, and once we figure out what the problems are, can we do anything about it to make it better in a randomized design? So, so the first, what they did is, the first 5,000 or so patients was just observational, then they took a pause, 
And then the next 5,000 they randomly assigned to two different groups. One group got an effort to try to make intervention to try to make things better, and the other group got control, the usual standard of care. Okay? So it was an observational cohort study. Let's figure out what's happening with an embedded randomized trial to try to intervene to make the situation better. And what they found was all kinds of stuff. The great majority of such patients wanted to be free of pain, as I told you earlier. But unfortunately, 50% of Americans had moderate or severe pain at least half the time in the last three days of their life. Half of Americans die in pain, people, still today, in our country. And 90 to 95% of patients want others, including their doctor, to listen to them near the end of their life, for example, about the nature of care they want. But the support study found that 53% of the time, the physician did not understand, for example, that the patient wanted to avoid CPR. The, doc, the patient actually said, you know, if my heart stops, given how seriously ill I am, let me die, doc. Half the time, the doctor didn't know this. 53% of the time, right? That's not a good thing. And in fact, given these and other failings in the care given to the seriously ill, and given the lack of adequate attention to issues of palliative care or hospice care, the support investigators designed an intervention whose objective was to improve five targeted outcomes. They said, okay, we studied the problem, let's fix it. We want to improve patient-physician agreement on CPR preferences. The doctor should know what the patient wants. We want to have better DNR orders. We want to have more patients have DNR orders and at the proper timing, not like after they're dead or even the day before they die, but, you know, weeks earlier. What is DNR? Uh, do not resuscitate. Okay. Yeah. We want to reduce the number of days in an ICU, in a coma, or in a ventilator before death. It doesn't serve any purpose. If you're going to die anyway, you shouldn't have this prolonged suffering. We want to have better pain control, and maybe we want to reduce needless hospital resource use. And they did a large-scale randomized controlled trial that involved all kinds of components, which I won't go into, to try to make things better. Oh, I will go into it. Here are the elements to their intervention. They had a development. They developed reliable model-based prognoses. In other words, they developed sort of computational algorithms to accurately predict what was going to happen. And they made sure the doctors knew it. So the doctors had reliable prognostic information. This patient is likely to die or not likely to die. They elicited patient and family preferences for end-of-life care, and they had a trained nurse do that, and then they made sure the doctor knew what the patient actually wanted. And last, they had a skilled nurse to facilitate interventions and discussions. Let's have someone on the scene whose job it is to try to make sure that all this communication is taking place. And unfortunately, the intervention did not improve any of the targeted outcomes. It did not improve communication between physicians and patients and families. It did not improve physician understanding of avoidance of CPR. It didn't improve the DNR orders. It didn't reduce days in ICU or coma or ventilator death. Had no effect on pain control and no effect on hospital resources. It was really depressing. $30 million is a lot of money on this RCT 20 years ago, especially. We had about 60 or more million today. It was spent trying to make things better, and they couldn't. They weren't able to make it better. Um, and actually, the situation with respect to end-of-life care, and specifically with respect to pain relief, is much worse in other parts of the world. This slide shows per capita consumption of morphine in 158 countries in the world. So morphine is a very safe, super cheap drug. I can walk into your room, give you an intravenous injection or subcutaneous injection of morphine, and relieve 96% of pain symptoms. And if I know what I'm doing, I can do it very delicately and have you be very happy and Alert, but without pain. Well, here's the United States. We had, I don't know, 78.6 milligrams per capita of morphine. But in the rest of the world, Greece, Pakistan, Honduras, Angola, if you're in Angola, you die in agony. Or Honduras, or Pakistan, or all these countries in the world, there's just no morphine. Probably you never thought about this. There are lots of people who are very concerned about this topic, how to enhance pain relief in developing world settings where there aren't access to this inexpensive, basic, safe drug that can be given to people. It makes my blood boil to see this. Now I'd like to turn to where people die. What determines the place of death? Is it, for example, patient preferences? So most, most of you, most people, not all, many people want to die in the hospital. Most people want to die at home. 
The question is, what determines the place of death? Is it patient preferences? Well, most people said they would prefer to die at home, but unfortunately, few patients are able to realize this preference. And home death is uncommon, though it's been increasing. So if you look at home deaths, in 1989, 15% of deaths were at home. In 2007, it had gone up to 24%, but it's still a minority. 76% of deaths are occurring outside in hospitals or nursing homes. Okay? And in the support study, they found no substantial relationship between a patient's preference for dying at home and whether they were able to do so. So here, here is they asked patients, would you like to die at home? Not at all, a little bit, moderately, quite a bit, very much. And then they looked at the percentage of patients dying in the hospital, and roughly speaking, there wasn't a ton of difference. Yes, these ones, these ones that didn't want to die at home were, uh, were less likely to die in a hospital, but across these preference ratings, there wasn't a lot of difference. Patient preferences, in other words, didn't seem to explain much of the variation in whether they were able to die at home or not. However, one thing that does help patients die at home is hospice care. And hospice care, this is what I used to do. I was a hospice doctor. I haven't seen patients now in, I don't know, 13 years. Hospice is a mode of terminal care that emphasizes palliation and relief of a patient's physical, emotional, and spiritual pain and suffering rather than treatment of the patient's underlying disease. Hospice care need, this is very important to understand this in your lives if you ever encounter this. Hospice care neither hastens nor delays death. That's not the point. Actually, sometimes it may delay death reasons we can talk about some other time. It is the active total care of patients whose disease is not responsive to curative treatment. So you go into the patient's bedside and, and you say, I can't stop your disease, I can't cure your disease, but there's so much I can do for you to confront it. Okay? So it's not abandoning the patient, it's quite the opposite. And the goal of such palliative care is the achievement of the best quality of life for patients and their families. In the United States, hospice care is multidisciplinary and outpatient. In England and in other countries, there are freestanding buildings, which are hospice, and also in our country, but in our country, it's mostly in their own home. Hospice nurses and doctors visit you in your home and take care of you. And it has numerous documented advantages. It's home-based. It provides for superior management of pain and non-pain symptoms. Patients are randomly assigned to hospice care and better pain relief. And it's associated with, better, with higher patient satisfaction. And over 30% of elderly decedents use hospice care at the time of their deaths, and now the majority, <coughs> over 65% of can cancer patients. So in our society, there's more and more people using hospice care. Part of the problem, though, is that they get it very late. And if you any had grandparents who used hospice care, you probably saw grandma got hospice care for like a week before she died. And probably the whole family was like, thank God the hospice nurses are here. But why didn't they come earlier? There's no reason to wait until two days before death. Do it two months before death. It's not going to hasten death to have someone get hospice care. Uh, Sophia? How much does hospice cost per person? Nothing. I mean, it's covered by Medicare if you're elderly. Okay. So if someone gets a disease earlier on and they don't have Medicare, can they Most insurance covers hospice okay. care, partly because it's cheaper than, you know, courses of chemotherapy are very expensive, hospitalization is very expensive. Hospice care is generally less expensive. But even if it were more expensive, because it's better, and we're a rich country, I think we should still do it. My defense of hospice care is not reliant on its expense. Nikki? How common uh, is hospice care for people that are at a younger age? Less common. Less common, but I don't know the numbers offhand, but it's still delivered to young people. Yes. Is there a bottom line between doctors um, having to treat patients versus kind of attending to their wishes of, you know, for example, resuscitation? You mean if the patient wants to be resuscitated but the doctor thinks it's a stupid decision? Yeah, like is there like some like legal sort of thing? So generally in those situations, my position is we respect the patient's wish. That, you know, they... Um, like, I wouldn't want to be resuscitated. I think you are making a dumb choice, but it's your body and your life. And if you wish to be resuscitated, I think we honor that. There are some unusual circumstances in which doctors will go to a court and say, Your Honor, we don't want to do this for these reasons, and get a court to agree that they're not obliged. In other words, you, the patient, can't force me to do something 
you know, maybe I'll find another doctor who's willing to do what you want. Part of the problem is that many patients have misperceptions about what happens with CPR. I used to assign a, uh, a paper in this class where they looked at episodes of cardiac arrest in movies and television. They found like a thousand of them. And they found that, you know, 80% of the time it was successful and the patient was immediately fine and it was completely fiction. Most of the time CPR is unsuccessful in the hospital. Most of the time. It doesn't, it doesn't save your life. Sometimes it does. Especially if you're young and you have like an injury and you have a cardiac arrest, your heart's fine, but it just stops because of whatever injury you've had. Um, but if you have a chronic you know, cancer and your heart stops, it, resuscitating you typically fails anyway. And it's not a good way to spend your last minutes on earth to have all these doctors yelling and screaming and pressing on your chest and doing all this stuff, putting lines in your big IVs and your groin and all of that stuff, first point. Second point, one of the things that, in this one I used to talk to patients about this, one of the things I would gently, I'm speaking to you quickly and telegraphically, needless to say, I wouldn't speak in this rapid fashion with this much brutality to a patient. I would have a totally different tone of voice, much slower, more kind, and bringing ideas up slowly. I wouldn't talk like this. But a key thing to communicate to a patient is that if you have metastatic lung cancer and your heart stops, even if you survive the CPR and we get your heart started again, gentle reminder, you still have the lung cancer. It's not like, ta-da, you know, you've been restored to life. You know, you've just restored to the status quo ante, right? you just come back to being a very seriously ill person. And people often don't doesn't quite register. They somehow think, oh, well, I'll get CPR and then I'll be fine. No, you just come back to being a really sick person. And, um, and so dying of a heart attack in those nine conditions is, is actually a blessing. I forgot your name. Danielle. Danielle. Yeah. Maybe this is a question for later, but I'm wondering what led you to go into hospice care. Because I'm sure it's quite a like emotionally draining job. Well, I think I told you that my mother was seriously ill when I was a boy, so she was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, which then was not treatable now it is, when I was six in 1968. And she died when I was in medical school, when I was 25, and she was 47. So I, my whole life I grew up with a seriously ill mother. She was a remarkable woman, just an extraordinary human being. And um, so I was always very concerned about this. And when I got to medical school, initially I think I told you I wanted to be a reconstructive surgeon, uh, which is a whole other set of stories I may tell you some other time. But very rapidly I sort of glommed on to becoming a hospice doctor because I wanted to care for the dying. Like I thought, we're not doing a good job of it. and Maybe I can make a difference. And so clinically, for the early part of my career, before I sort of became a research scientist full time, that's what I did. I was a hospice medical director in Chicago. I was at Mass General in the Palliative Medicine Consult Service. Here, I'm nominally affiliated with the Yale Hospital. But I've never seen a patient there in the last 13 years. So. So that's why I wanted to make a difference in the care of the dying, because I just thought it was a moral failing in our society, which I had seen. Did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. My mother got good end of life care, actually. But we were upper middle class, you know, Washington, D.C. people, well connected. She had good doctors, you know. She had a good, mostly a good death. I forgot your name. Did you just raise your hand? No. Someone else? I missed. Other hands go up. Yeah, what's your name? Joseph. Joseph. Yeah. Um, do people typically recover out of hospice care? Like, is hospice care basically like they're, you just accept they're going to die if they 100% after? Once know. in a while. No, hospice does not commit you to death. I mean, if you suddenly get better, you can be discharged from hospice. It's not like, it's not like Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you know. <laughs> I'm not dead yet. Yes, you are, you know. You know, uh, you know. Uh, you know, you get better, you can be discharged. And there's some rare, hilarious cases of misdiagnoses where people were sent to hospice care and actually they, not, they were not terminally ill. And they go on their normal lives. But it's uncommon. Usually the people who go to hospice care are seriously ill. And the point is to take really good care of them at the end of their lives. The kind of care all of us would want. We could get them. What's your name? Um, Mahmoud. Mahmoud. Yeah. Um, I want to ask, I can see there. Uh-huh. And like, um, there's like injuries like, um, Yes. Does that count as 
Genesis? Yes. So it's I would not intended. Just yeah, it doesn't matter. It's a doctor caused injury. It's necessary. It's unavoidable. It's not intended. Yes, and rib fractures are very painful. And when you press on the chest, you often fracture the person's ribs, um, even if you do everything right. And especially in these frail elderly people whose bones are like sticks, you know, they just break like, not on your bones, but I did CPR on you, it's, I could still break your ribs, but it's not as common. So, yeah. I mean, I'm remembering all the times that I, you know, the code in a hospital is, is quite a remarkable uh, event. You literally jump onto the bed and, uh, and you know, you're kneeling at the patients on the bed and compressing their chest until they can get everything else set up. But two, so, so hospice care, this is, this is what hospice care is, and two predictors of whether a patient died at home were structural factors unrelated to patient preferences. So here are two predictors of dying in a hospital. The more money we spend uh, in a given area, I'm sorry, the more money we spend on hospice care in a given area, there's a, you know, each additional $10 per beneficiary yields a 2.8% decrease in hospital death. So funding our hospices makes it possible for people to avoid dying in a hospital. On the other hand, the regional bed supply, the number of hospital beds in the area, each additional bed per thousand beneficiaries, yields a 5% increase in a hospital death. So it's like the giant sucking sound, right? If you build hospitals, patients fill them, okay? This is structure versus agency again. These are things outside yourself, hospice spending, and number of hospital beds that affects whether you are able to realize your desire to die at home or not. And in fact, this slide, which sets the stage for some work we'll talk about at the end of the class on geography and health, this slide shows geographic, so-called small area variation in the United States. Here the country is divided into 306 so-called hospital referral regions. Uh, and um, so this is the percentage of patients dying in a hospital by region. And this is the percent of Medicare deaths occurring in hospitals. The dark blue is 40% or more, 35% or more, and so on. And you can see that there's a lot of variation from place to place in what fraction of people die in a hospital. As if it's not so much who you are, but where you are that matters to whether you die in a hospital. Why Mississippi in particular? Is this dense? I'm not 100% sure. A lot's going, there are a lot of things that are different about Mississippi than the rest of the country. Uh, and so I don't know which of those things helps to explain this uh, high intensity in a hospital death. But the reason this is important is that it says that where you live affects the kind of health care you get, possibly more than your biology, which is a theme in this class. Thus, if you are a patient who wants to die at home, and you happen to live in an area with lots of hospital beds, you are especially unlikely to have your wishes fulfilled. On the bright side, these results suggest that public policy matters, and it can affect what happens, both in the sense of increasing the likelihood of a particular outcome, and also in the sense of increasing the ability of people to realize their own objectives. In other words, we can look around now. If you're a doctor in Mississippi and you're saying, God, there's so many patients dying in a hospital, you say, well, I just go across the border to Louisiana or Georgia, and I can say, they're doing better than we are. I know it's possible. Right? You have a proof of concept from another area. It's like a policy experiment that you can do. This kind of variation can show you. And again, this is another example of the classic issue of structure versus agency. Let's turn to another aspect of a good death, which I mentioned at the beginning, which is that while 89% of Americans rate not burdening family members as a key aspect of good terminal care, the majority of Americans have deaths which are burdensome. 55% of families have at least one of the following effects. They need large amounts of family caregiving. They have a major life change for a family member. Other family members get ill from the stress of caring for them. They lose most of their family savings. This pisses me off more than you can imagine. But a third of Americans go bankrupt in caring for the first person to die in the family. Which doesn't make any sense, right? You didn't choose this predicament. We should be able to ensure this away. There's no reason. And you use, you use up all your resources in the first person to die, leaving no money for the next person. Right? If I die before my wife and we consume all the resources, what happens to her? She's now in poverty. This is not a joke. 
There's no reason people should be impoverished because someone is dying, especially in a situation with a country with the kind of health insurance and health care we have. So not being a burden to family, most of Americans don't want to be a burden to family, but uh, at 55% of them have at least one of these uh, outcomes. And finally, let's take a look at prognosis, which was in our top five list of things people care about the most. Here's, a, here's what one uh, patient, this was a, a patient of mine years ago now, like when I was in Chicago, this is like 25 years ago, I'm still using this example. And she said to me, how long will it be, doctor? I can deal with the physical part of caring for my dad. Her dad was dying. So the dad was a patient. This is the patient's daughter. Her dad was dying of renal failure. But I just want to know. I watch him breathe. And with every breath, I wonder if that will be his last. The nurse said, we can't say how long it will be. But I want to know, because it hurts me to see him like this. And I don't want to see him like this. Is he going to linger or get worse? What is going to happen? And I want to be with him as much as possible, and I want to be there when he dies. I don't want to miss that. This daughter is exhausted. She's been by her dad's bedside for weeks, hasn't left the house for fear that the moment she goes to the grocery store or to the dry cleaner, that's when dad will die. She really wants prognostic information for pragmatic reasons, but furthermore, for emotional reasons. She's so worried about this man. Is he lingering? Is he going to get worse? What's going to happen? She is suffering from the lack of prognostic information. Larger, more formal, quantitative studies support the salience of prognosis in patients' minds. Again and again, surveys of patients document what, that they rate prognosis as the number one piece of information they want from their physicians. I wrote a whole book about this called Death Foretold, Prophecy and Prognosis in Medical Care. I think I assigned some readings of work that we did years ago uh, for, to, for today. Uh, yeah, which I'll talk about in just a moment. So the question now becomes, are doctors able to formulate and communicate a reliable prognosis, one that both patients and doctors could then use and act on? How do doctors do? Are, are they able to do this? Okay, they can diagnose an illness, they can treat an illness, but can they predict its issue? Well, we conducted a prospective cohort study of prognostic error, which was in your readings, and our objective was to quantify the magnitude and nature of the error and evaluate some of its determinants, patient or physician factors that might help explain when doctors were in error. And here are the most uh, basic results. So here we have, I don't know, I forgot how many patients, a thousand or how many were there? Uh, something like a thousand patients, I don't remember. Each dot is a patient. And here is the observed survival, how long the patients lived on a kind of log log plot. And here is the predicted survival. So if the doctor predicted the patient would live 30 days, and the patient lived 30 days, you would fall right on the diagonal. If the doctor predicted the patient would live, I don't know, a year, 365 days, and the patient lived 365 days, there's that one patient right there. The doctor predicted you'll live a year, and the patient lived a year. So the first thing to notice is that there are not too many points on or near the diagonal. There's a lot of spread in these points, which is one kind of error, right, the imprecision. But there's an additional kind of error, in addition to the imprecision, which is the miscalibration. What is that error, looking at these data? Can you tell? Too optimistic. Yes. Most of the points are above the line, not below the line. If the doctors were erring at random, sometimes overestimating survival, sometimes underestimating survival, you'd have as many points above as below the line. But that's not what we see. Most of the points are, are above the line. These are all patients that the doctor thought would live six months, and every one of them died within a week. How is that possible? I think, I'm so stupid, I can't see this large group of people, I think they're going to live six months, they all die within days. Shouldn't the doctor be better at that? In fact, overall, doctors overestimated survival by a factor of over five in these data. And this shows the physician's objective best estimate. This is the... This is the doctor's prediction to us. So we, we had a cohort of patients. We asked the doctor, you know, how long? Just tell us. Don't, you don't tell the patient how long do you think this patient has to live. And then we followed the patients forward to see how long they did live, and we compared those two numbers. And we also asked the doctors, well, what did you tell the patient? So we have the, the, the formulated prognosis. That's what they told us. The communicated prognosis. That's what they told the patient. And the observed reality, that's what actually happened. 
Um, and part of the problem is, is that when doctors are so over-optimistic, it can lead them to encourage painful and unnecessary treatments. If I think you're going to live a year, I say, oh my God, there's all the stuff that you need to do. And then you waste the last two weeks of your life doing all of this stupid stuff, which you could have spent better. Or you fail to tell your, your, whenever I was taking care of patients, and the patients would ask me, or the children of the patient would say, you know, grandpa's dying, should be, if you ever in this situation, and someone you know and love is seriously ill, and you're debating whether you should go or not go, go. I guarantee you the doctors are grossly overestimating the prospects for survival. And you would rather go and not need to have gone than fail to go and grandpa dies because you didn't go, okay? Which was the typical thing that happened. So if you're wrong and you think the patient's going to live a long time and they don't, the family misses a chance to have this be together. You spend a lot of, you recommend painful and expensive treatments. This is not just idle theorizing, this matters. How your ability to predict is crucially important to your ability to function as a competent doctor, and yet is completely neglected in medical schools, which is another whole lecture I won't give you, uh, and why. So if you're interested in this topic, it's in the book that I wrote called Death Foretold. So what about the communication of prognosis? Do physicians discuss prognosis with patients and families, and if so, in what way? So in the same study, but in a different paper, we looked at the communicated prognosis, and we examined physicians' intended prognostic disclosure practice in the subset of 326 terminally ill cancer patients who had been referred by their own physicians to hospice care. So this is very important to understand this. These are seriously ill people who have been sent to hospice care by their own doctors. And now we ask their doctor, you sent Mrs. Jones to hospice care because you expect she's going to die. Tell us what you think the prognosis was and tell us what you told Mrs. Jones. Well, let's look. For 96% of these patients, the doctors were willing and able to formulate an objective prognosis and tell us. Most of the time they said, yeah, Mrs. Jones can live a month or Mrs. Jones can live two months or three weeks or whatever the hell they said. Now, what did you tell the patients? 37% of the time, they told the patient the same thing they told us. Only a third of the time. 23% of the time, they wouldn't tell the patient. They told, I, you, you know, you, the doctor, told me what you thought was going to happen. Did you tell the patient? No, I wouldn't tell the patient. Why? It's your own patient, gone to hospice, wants to know. You won't tell them. I thought we should have a whole book. And 40% of the time, they told the patient something, but something different than they told us. 70%, they sugarcoated it and told the they told us the patient's going to live a month. They told the patient you're going to live six months. Or the reverse, sometimes they were pessimistic. They told the patient, uh, they told us they think the patient's going to live a month. What do you tell the patient? A week. There's mo interesting motivations for doctors to do both of these kinds of behaviors. And this graph combines the results from both of our studies. It illustrates the differences between actual survival objective or foreseen or formulated survival, and subjective or foretold survival for 300 terminally ill cancer patients. It's the difference between a formulated and communicated prognosis. And so, so this shows, this is time since inception of the study, and this shows the per person surviving, and this curve shows the actual survival. So this is a very steep survival curve. So at time zero, 100% of the patients are alive, and they start to die very precipitously. This is a hospice patient. So median survival, I think, is 24 days or something here. Is that right? Yeah. The median, and this next line is the survival curve that would have been observed if the patients lived as long as the doctors formulated. And the median formulated survival is 75 days. So patients lived 24 days. Doctors thought they were going to live 75 days. And then this is the survival that would have been observed if they lived as long as the doctor communicated, and the median communicated survival was 90 days. So patients become twice removed from the reality of their condition. First, because of unknowing, unconscious, non-deliberate errors in the prognoses that doctors formulate. And second, because of additional, conscious, knowing errors in the prognoses that doctors communicate. So patients don't get told nor their families, this very important information. I forgot your name. Joseph. Joseph. Is there another Joseph that just asked a question or no? That was me. That was you again. Okay, yeah, sorry. I sat there last time. Okay, okay. God, you guys are confusing me. Um, okay. Is there a correlation to non-disclosure and survival rate? So, for example, I know that, like, culturally, some people don't even tell, like, like, I know 
in China, for example, sometimes you will go yes. you know, handle your grandparents' illness. They'll, they'll get like a cancer diagnosis or they'll get like a survival prognosis. And then the relative doesn't even tell the grandparents. Yes. Anyone. They'll be like, oh, yeah, you're, you're completely fine. Yes. Like, do we know that affects the survival rates? Because it's possible that, is it possible that like worrying about how much time you have makes you more stressed and therefore more likely to die? Or, I don't know. Yes. So, all of this literature is reviewed in my book. I can answer your question in multiple ways, and I'm about to do so. So, first of all, I'm going to ask you something. Does grandma in China really not know she's dying, do you think? Is grandma so stupid that these hushed tone conversations, she's, she's losing weight, she's in the hospital, she can't eat, her loved ch beloved children are having hushed tone conversations with the doctors in the hallway, and come in with these rosy colored things. Do you think grandma doesn't know, in fact? I, I think it's possible that they that they can think of something else. Like, they can think it's, it's not a term, like, they, they might not be terminally ill. And also, it's possible that, like, possible or likely? I mean, I feel like people would tend to not want to think that they're going to die. Okay. So. Does everyone participate in the same cultural norms, or only grandmas are not in the know? When grandmas were daughters, would they have done the same thing, do you think? Would they remember, for example, having conversations about their grandma, and they were in the, in the corner, and now here comes grandma 40 years later, now she's in the hospital bed, you think grandma doesn't know about this cultural norm? That's fair. I mean, people have very creative ways of convincing themselves of uh, their nonsense. But, but really, I'm trying to yeah. defend this email perspective <laughs> on this culture, but I'm telling you, grandma knows. First thing I'm telling you. Okay? okay. Now, I'm not saying that we need to force grandma to confront this reality. So, for example, to be a really good doctor, you have to identify what your patients want. So, what I would do in that type of situation, especially for people that were from foreign cultures, is I would sit with them and I would say, you know, I'll sit down, calm tone of voice, communicate plenty of empathy, and no rush. And I'm going to do none of that now. I'm going to talk to you in a staccato way. <laughs> you sit down and you ask, and you say to grandma, you know, people vary in how much information they want about their medical condition. Some people want a lot of information and some people don't want much information. What kind of patient are you? And grandma will tell you, Chinese grandmas would say to me, Doc, I know I'm dying, but I'm worried about my children. Let's pretend I'm not dying for their sake. <laughs> so it's all a fiction. Everyone is pretending, but they're all in on it, and so it's okay. Or if I think actually they're deluded, and they're deluded in a way that's harming grandma, you know, like, Doc, don't give her these medications to ease her suffering because she's going to be rebounding tomorrow. You know, let me have some more conversations with you about this delusion. This grandma is actually dying, whatever you may think. So, first point. Second point, I'm not saying you need to force the horrible truth down every unwilling patient's throat. You know, like, don't tell me anything, doctor. I must tell you, you know, I'm a Nazi doctor. You know, no, that's, that's not what, that's not humane. Okay? If people don't want to know, you can respect that after an appropriate conversation. Now, in terms of whether it actually affects longevity, uh, there have been, believe it or not, some randomized controlled trials of prognostic information and recovery from illness. And the citations are in the book that are told. And the bottom line is we have no evidence that it's helpful. Not. Yes, uh, Sophia. Yes. Just out of curiosity, do you tend to see more patients that are in denial of their situation or the patient's family members? I've seen both. If I had to guess, I would say it's uh, more patients than family members in denial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, it depends. One of the toughest situations you have, you often find a situation clinically, this has been my experience, where, you know, grandma's dying or grandpa's dying and the family comes together and the, the child would, that had the most contested relationship with their parent is the one least willing to stop life support. The ones that had a good relationship are at peace with their parents and care for their parents. So the ones that have to contest with really very hard for them. And they want to be seen as maybe atoning for their prior behavior, or, or they want more time to fix their relationship, or they have a host of reasons. Very difficult clinical circumstances to handle that. You know, three of the kids say, let's let grandma to go. One of them says, no, I don't want to. Boy, that takes days of conversation, excavation of the family history, and so on, to, to get to. So that person might be in denial, paradox. Uh, hold on. That was Sophia. And so that makes you um, the other name I screw up. I'm sorry, Emily. No, not Emily. Please tell me. <laughs> Lucy. Lucy. Um, my question is... Um, I promise you by the end, 
I will have <laughs> anyone who has told me their name five times on a lap. You keep stressing this concept of like taking your time um, in hospice as a doctor, which to me is, as a person who has not been in hospice, is really conflicting with like the doctors that I've come into contact with who often seem like they're in a rush, and I guess I'm just curious how that plays out, like there's a difference. Well, because the way hospice care is compensated, it's designed, and people go in, it's not a very remunerative profession to be a hospice doctor. Uh, you know, you it's designed in a way you do spend time. If you're a good good hospice doctor, and if you're any good doctor, you spend time with your patients. But the whole system now is screwed up. I, I don't go into it in this class. There are other classes you can take on health policy, but you know something like a third of our healthcare dollars go to non-providers, the CEOs of the companies, the the bureaucrats, the administrators, the insurance claim processors. What a huge, colossal, deadweight loss of money. All that money could be going billions and billions of dollars. You know, if we just had a kind of NHS type system, I mean, just a Canadian type system, we didn't have to go a lot. There's so many better ways to organize our healthcare spending. So, um, you know, so your doctors are not having to see six people per hour because they work for, you know, an HMO that some of your parents are doctors. Just talk to them. They'll tell you how awful it is and how their lives have changed in the last 40 years. It's totally different. In mostly in the worst ways. Mayor. This is semi unrelated, but were you a hospice doctor for the entire time you were practicing? Yes. So I finished my medical, I, I trained as a general internist, and then I went to the University of Chicago in 1995. I immediately started as a hospice doctor. And I worked as a hospice doctor on the south side of Chicago, which is a very distinctive community, and I had a very weird practice. Two thirds of my patients were poor African American patients. And when I say poor, I mean hole in the roof poor, and one third were like, upper middle class University of Chicago professors. Yeah. So it was a very interesting practice. But I love being a hospice doctor. Um, okay. <coughs> so let's see where I'm on. Uh, so here again are the five items uh, that the great majority of Americans, so here's a report card on terminal care in the United States. So here are the things that we said that we we're going to talk about today. The, you know, that the majority of Americans think are a really important part of, an, of a good death. Being free of pain, not being a burden to family, having the doctor listens, dying at home and knowing what to expect. And here's the percent of Americans, as we've now seen, achieving these objectives. It's pathetic, our report card, right? We do a crappy job caring for the dying uh, in our society. And these problems persist, despite the fact that we spend over $100 billion every year caring for people in the last year of life despite the fact that everyone eventually experiences the outcome. Unlike all the other health problems we're discussing in this class, it's not like those people are going to die, but we're not, so we don't care. We're all going to die, right? There should be a lot of political will to fix this. You know, if you're dying of cancer, you may not care if people are dying of heart disease. You know, or, if you, or if you die in the city, you may not care about the availability of hospitals in rural areas. That's their problem, not my problem. But death is a problem that afflicts all of us, so we should all care about this. And so, the, so we can conclude that the quality of death in America is poor, that this poor quality varies in discernible ways, and that improving care of the dying will not be easy. Now, end-of-life care is, is often so bad that people have advocated for, and hospitals have implemented, death with dignity programs in several states that allow doctors to prescribe lethal doses of barbiturates for people to self-administer if those people meet certain stringent criteria. And this slide shows various attributes of patients participating in one death with dignity program at the Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle compared to groups from Washington State and Oregon more generally, and it's taken from your readings. Unsurprisingly, these patients have the same primary concerns about their end-of-life care experience as anyone else. So, you know, uh, what are their concerns? Loss of autonomy. These are the Seattle Cancer Care compared to Washington State and Oregon. You know, 97% of these people are worried about loss of autonomy, loss of dignity. People are worried about, like, defecating on themselves, having their family members have to change their diapers and stuff like that. People worry about being naked in front of their family members, being a burden on their family members. You know, people are worried about this. Inadequate pain control. People are worried about this and so on. So, um, so the people in the program have roughly the same concerns as, as sort of citizen, uh, regular citizens. Uh, 
And some percentages are lower here, for example, being a burden to one's family, because this study assessed whether people felt they were a burden, not whether they feared they might become one. Okay, so the higher numbers in the previous slides about burdening your family were like, I, I wouldn't want to be a burden to my family, whereas here is, it, are you a burden to your family? And, you know, the percentage is different. And 14 of 40 patients who participated in the study lived longer than six months, which also reflected the difficulties of prognosis. So they were all supposed to live less than six months, but about a quarter lived more than six months. And about 60% of patients receiving a lethal prescription actually used it to die. Now, I am very conflicted about this. I wrote another whole book chapter about this years ago. If you're obsessed with this topic, you can read it, or other people have written about this. Like my feelings about physician-assisted suicide. And here, here's in a nutshell my thoughts on this topic. Part of my problem with these types of programs, although I think they respect patient autonomy and they are terrific, is that they eradicate the pain by eradicating the patient. Right? In other words, before we do this stuff, let's clean up our act and take better care of patients first. Right? To me, this is like an easy way out. We're going to provide you such terrible, terrible uh, end-of-life care that you're going to choose to take barbiturates to die instead. What kind of a society is that? Right? We should do a better job caring for the dying, such that these types of programs are very rarely, if ever, needed. But, on the other hand, if I wanted to end my own life, I absolutely would expect the right to do that, and I would like to appreciate some help. Right? So this is the part of me that is you know, a little conflicted on how to resolve this type of a policy dilemma. So what can be done to improve the sorry state of end-of-life care in our society? We can enhance communication between patients and doctors. For example, activated patients. In other words, teach the patients before they go to their doctor. I don't know if you guys have ever had this. Bring a family member with you or write your questions out and have a checkbox when you talk to the doctor. Right? Because once you get into the room with the doctor, you forget everything. Or they tell you stuff and your mother says, what did the doctor say? And you're like, I can't remember. You know, especially if it's a serious illness when you're really rattled. Investigate the optimal nature and timing of transitions between care systems, right? Transitions between a hospital and a nursing home and a nursing home and a hospice are often where things go wrong. Evaluate the role of the specialty of palliative care. Maybe we can do better with palliative medicine because these guys are the experts. Develop the science of prognostication. Now with artificial intelligence systems, actually, when I first started teaching this 30 years ago, it was, on a, it was a fantasy that we would have AI systems that could do a really good job predicting. Now we have them. It's unbelievable. Or design systems of care that address patient preferences. For example, hospice spending or pain is a fifth vital sign. So the four classic vital signs were heart rate, temperature, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. When I was a young doctor, there was a big push to require nurses to also collect how much pain are you in and write it on the clipboard at the foot of the patient's bed. Because the doctor coming into the room was saying, oh, does they have a fever? Is her heart rate up? They're in pain. Yesterday they were in pain. The day before they were in pain. Never mind, I won't treat the pain. Can't do that. The number's right there. It forces you to think about it. So changing the systems can maybe improve the nature of the care uh, that you give. Um, as we saw in the readings, many of the things patients say are important are ones that doctors do not feel are important. I'm going to keep going on, because as usual, I took so much time with other questions. I'm trying really hard to stay on schedule, but you guys are such a good class. And you want stories, that's why I digress. And I Anyway, something needs to be done about our priorities, and listening to patients is the key to any redesign of our system for providing care um, at the end of life. Well, what might be done uh, with a rampant prognostic error? There are several possible ways to enhance the prognostic accuracy of physicians, and so perhaps optimize the choices that they make with respect to care they give to patients at the end of life. And these include things like eliciting the prognosis from a dispassionate physician. As you saw in one of the readings, the better the doctor knew the patient, the worse was their prognostic accuracy. So you want a doctor who's not invested in the outcome to make a prediction. Elicit the prognosis in terms of probability rather than time. So instead of asking the doctor, how long will this patient live, a week, a month, whatever, you say, what's the probability that this patient will live six months or more? What's the probability that this patient will live three months or more? You already should be feeling, you know, if I ask you, are you going to get, you know, what are you going to get on the physics test? Are you going to get 100, or are you going to get a 90, or are you going to get an 80, or whatever? That might make you nervous. If I say, what's the probability you'll get a 75 or more? Well, I can give you a 50% chance, or 80% chance, or whatever. 
You can supplement physicians' estimates with machine learning models, and you can average the prognostic estimate across physicians. Two heads are better than one. Let me explain this last idea. Suppose you get a doctor to make a prediction. It is more accurate if you get several doctors to do so, and then you average the predictions. And this has something to do with something known as signal-to-noise theory. Raise your hands if you've ever heard about this. Some of you engineers. Higher. How many of you are there? Two, two three. three. I'm not going to ask you any more questions. Just going to be two. <laughs> so, uh, so hold on. Your name was you're Liz, Liz, you go by. And you are Kara. No. Sophia. Sophia. Are there two Sophias? What? You said Sophia, right? And you're Sophia, and you're Lucy, and you're Ben. Okay, so we had a few people. So let me illustrate this with a digression. Suppose we want to extract the changes induced uh, in cerebral activity by a visual stimulus. And to study this, we put the person, we put little electrodes on their brain, and we shine a bright light in their eye, and so here is where the stimulus occurs. We flash the bright light in their eye, and here's a trace across time of the electrical uh, signals in their occipital cortex, where the visual part of the brain is, right in the back here. Okay? So we're measuring what does the occipital cortex, which is where the inputs from the eye come, do electrically in response uh, to the stimulus. Uh, and typically, to study this, we administer several flashes of light and record the EEG, and typically, the changes are very small and could not be seen in a raw EEG, electroencephalogram. We need a procedure to separate the changes related to the stimulus from the remaining EEG activity. And the next figure is a simulation of this process. If we give our subject a lot of stimuli, the basal activity is more or less random in this process. Uh, so if there are multiple stimuli, and then we average them, and then now we get a smooth curve. So here's the stimulus, and here's what actually is happening. And the reason that this happens is that the noise, the randomness, is random. Sometimes things are going up or down at random. But the underlying real stimulus is really there. So the, the random error cancels each other out. The ups and downs, which are random, they cancel each other out when you random across the stimuli. And you enhance the signal and suppress the noise when you average across in this type of a situation. And it's the same uh, with doctors. If you average, the doctors have some error, I have some error, you have some error, she has some error, we're all predicting what's going to happen. The real signal we might have in common, that some, you're overestimating, I'm underestimating, she's overestimating, you're underestimating, those little errors cancel each other out, the random errors, but the real signal is enhanced. And that's why averaging across doctors improves the accuracy of the prediction. Same, by the way, with uh, financial uh, prognostications. Now, there are two final topics I want to discuss. And one is, who should speak for patients at the end of life? Many or most patients often cannot decide for themselves what should happen at the end of life, for example, because they're unconscious. And the question is, who should decide when the patient can't speak? The doctor? family, or maybe the patient at an earlier point in time. And so substituted judgment has been proposed as a method for promoting the autonomy of mentally incapacitated patients. But the accuracy of surrogate decision makers in reflecting the true wishes of patients may be actually may be questionable. And in this study, 70 currently competent but chronically ill elderly patients were paired with close family members and primary care providers. So we had the patient, the loved one, and the doctor. And the wishes of the patients were compared to these possible surrogates. The subjects were queried regarding a hypothetical CPR scenario under circumstances of current health and progressive dementia. So I ask you, what would you want done if you had your current health, or what would you want done if you had progressive dementia? You tell me. I ask your family member, he tells me. I ask your doctor, she tells me. And now I compare those predictions. Most patients predicted that both their physicians, 90%, and their family members, 87%, would accurately represent their wishes. But in fact, neither type of surrogate was able to do so. The percent agreement ranged between 59 and 88%. So here, for example, is in your current health, uh, here's whether the patient wants to be do not resuscitate or get CPR, and here's what the doctor thinks about this patient. 
So here on the diagonal is where they agree. Uh, I'm sorry, here on this diagonal is where they agree. The patient wants CPR and the doctor thinks they do. The patient does not want CPR and the doctor thinks they do not. But these off diagonal elements, uh, the doctor does not match the patient's preferences in this situation or in the dementia scenario. And in fact, something similar happened with family. There was some percent error in the family uh, predictions as well. Well, if doctors and family members are lousy proxies, how about patients themselves as a proxy? Uh, who knows what the Odysseus contract refers to? Anyone take English 129? You did? Did you read the Odyssey? Yes. Or, or the Iliad? Both. Yeah. Okay. So what happens in the Odyssey? Do you remember? Um, I mean, this looks like like sirens. Thing. Yes. Yeah. All these beautiful sirens, right? Yeah. <laughs> Who's that on the mast there with his eyes bug-eyed? Odysseus. And why is he there? Uh, they like tied him down so he wouldn't get convinced to like jump in the water by the sirens. Yeah, but what did Odysseus tell his men as they were? Athena comes to Odysseus and oh, says, uh, "You're going to pass by the sirens, and the sirens are appear to be beautiful maidens who sing this." fantastic song it makes you forget of your desire forget all your worries and your desires to go home and you're going to go to the sirens and you're going to crash your boat you're all going to die and they're going to eat you or whatever the sirens do so what does odysseus do he like tells them before like they go into like the strait that like tie me up and like don't listen to what i say when i like am in that when state. i'm ordering you to 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 countermand my wishes and go to the rocks ignore me and if anything uh tie, make my bounds tighter so he fills all the men's ears with wax, except his own. They have, they, he's tied to the mast. If you've ever heard that expression, being tied to the mast. And he, of all humans, got to hear the siren song and survive. Smart guy, Odysseus. Pretty <laughs> sneaky guy. Devious, very devious guy. So this is called an Odysseus contract, where you bind your future self. You say, no matter what I tell you in the future, this is what you need to do. It's very hard to honor that, right? Because if you tell me, you know... I do not want you to resuscitate me no matter what. And then 10 years from now, you're dying, and you're saying, I've got to change my mind. Actually, I do want to be resuscitated. No, nope, I'm sorry. I'm not going to resuscitate you because your former self said you didn't want it. Very difficult to implement. But we can, uh, we can imagine having a person bind their future self. And it's called an Odysseus contract or an advanced directive uh, in, in, in some ways. And in fact, people do not appear to estimate how they would find possible states they might find themselves in the future very reliably. For example, if you ask people, a colostomy is when, when uh, possibly some of you have had it. That's not big enough to have any. If you, there are 200 students, someone would have a colostomy. It's when a, a segment of your intestine has been cut, and then a loop of bowel is brought to the surface, a hole in your skin, and you have this little plastic bag that collects all the stool, and you have to empty it, clean it out, it interferes with sex. It's, it's a burden to have a colostomy. If I told you that you would have to have this, it might be smelly and difficult and so on, you might be like, oh, God, I would hate that. You ask patients, you use the, uh, you use the utility estimation. Remember the few classes ago we taught you how to estimate the utility? They think the utility of this state is 0.8, but you ask patients with a colostomy, and they don't think it's so bad. They're, they think it's worse than not having it, but it's not as bad as you think it would be, 0.92. Or same with dialysis. You ask dialysis every three times a week. You have to drive to a dialysis center, be connected, and wait for three hours while they clean your blood. What a pain in the butt. It's painful. You need procedures. Not that painful, but anyway. Non-patients think it would suck to be on dialysis. Patients on dialysis don't think it's so bad, although they, they know it's bad. So we're bad at forecasting what states will be like when we are uh, in them. And there are a number of reasons for this, psychological reasons having to do with cognitive biases that we have, uh, and adaptation. Human beings get used to things. And so this is a reason that advanced directives and Odysseus contracts can break down, even though they would seem to be a very appealing uh, solution. So um, the way that the healthcare system treats a vulnerable terminal ill patients is instrumental in whether a patient ultimately has a dignified death. And this is related to the classic argument advanced by psychologist B.F. Skinner in a book of his, a famous book written half a century ago called Beyond Freedom and Dignity. And Skinner argues that dignity is not an inherent attribute of individuals originating within them, 
but rather is a product of their physical and social environment, at least in Skinner's view. Now, there are other philosophers and wise men and women who do not agree with Skinner. For example, very famously, Viktor Frankl, who was put in a concentration camp and wrote um, a very famous book on meaning, the title of which I'm blocking on right now. Does anyone remember?